soft drinks, soda, pop. Carbonated drinks are a common part of life throughout the world. They've been around a long time and have some interesting material culture relating to them. Prior to the 18th century, drinks have been carbonated through fermentation or through natural gases present in certain mineral waters. These mineral waters were marketed as medicinal cure-alls, a famous example being from Niederseltzes in Germany, from which we get the word seltzer water. At the end of the 18th century, chemists had developed methods to artificially carbonate water. The French chemist, Gabriel Francois Vanel, analysed French mineral waters and in 1750 produced soda water by mixing two drams of soda and marine acid in a pint of water. In 1767, Joseph Priestley in England created carbonated water by passing water from one vessel to another through a layer of carbon dioxide over a fermenting mass in a brewery vat. He later achieved the same effect using sulfuric acid and chalk, publishing a paper on the topic in 1772. A Swedish chemist, Tobern Bergman, developed an apparatus to carbonate water using this method in 1770 in order to create synthetic mineral water by adding various minerals to the carbonated water to compete with the natural mineral water that was imported from Germany at the time. Johann Jacob Schwepp, a German-born Swiss watchmaker, developed a practical way to commercially carbonate water and founded the Schwepp's Company in Geneva in 1783. In 1792, he expanded his company to London, opening a factory in Drury Lane. Initially, these carbonated drinks were sold in earthenware bottles, similar to those used by the mineral water bottlers, but these were found to be permeable to high gas pressures. Schweppes developed a bottle with a rounded bottom, a drunken bottle that would not stand up. This meant that the cork was never able to dry out, and thus was able to keep a good seal and prevent the contents going flat. Schwepp's London branch initially failed and he returned to Geneva. In his absence, William Hamilton of Dublin patented a method of preparing soda water and adding flavouring syrups using this type of bottle, and has been widely credited for inventing the bottle, which is now referred to by collectors as a Hamilton bottle and as a torpedo bottle by others. As with beer, British government taxes held back the popularity of soda waters there until 1833, when demand and production soared. Soda water became widely sold and consumed in this kind of bottle. These bottles were each individually blown in two-piece moulds, and needed to be quite thick, strong glass to withstand the internal pressures. This created a hazardous work environment, as bottles with flaws in the glass, I don't know if you can see, but there's a bubble in here. These could explode uh, while being corked, uh, while being labelled, or even while being crated. Workers took to wearing face guards and heavy leather gauntlets to protect themselves from the glass shrapnel. By the time it reached the retailer, the dangerous bottles would be removed more or less via attrition. This example here has J. Gray and Sons Auckland embossed into the glass. Embossed labels are common on soda water bottles. As I said in my beer video, New Zealand had no bottle manufacturing capability until 1922, so these bottles are all made to order at bottle factories in Britain and shipped over in bulk for the soft drink makers here in the colonies. Now, clearly, this bottle does not lend itself to table settings, as by design, it can't stand up. And various, sometimes ornate, stands were developed for this purpose. Another contemporary carbonated drink that noticeably did not use the torpedo bottle was ginger beer. For those not familiar, ginger beer is a very different drink from ginger ale, which is a sparkling clear drink, often containing cayenne pepper for that extra spiciness. Up until the middle of the 19th century, many ginger beers had an alcohol content of 10 to 12 percent. In 1855, in Britain, a law on spirits taxing beverages with over 2 percent alcohol resulted in ginger beer manufacturers diluting their beers using carbonated water. Now, ginger beers are not very attractive looking.
They're a cloudy beverage, often with inclusions floating about in them. They are delicious. Just not that pretty. They're also extremely photosensitive. So much so that even black glass was not dark enough to stop them from photodegrading. So stoneware, like this, continued to be used well into the 20th century, when preservatives were developed, allowing them to be bottled in other materials. Like this. As the 19th century wore on, other technologies were experimented with as an alternative to the torpedo bottle for soft drinks. This would inevitably require a greater degree of sophistication than shove a cork in it and keep it wet. In 1872, Hiram Codd patented a unique bottle that made use of a glass or ceramic marble in the neck of the bottle to seal it. This is an example here. In the factory, the marble would be jammed into a rubber seal held into the neck of the bottle. You can see the groove in the top here that would hold the rubber o-ring. To open it, a wooden tool was used to push the marble from the seal into the bottle, where it remained captured in the chamber. With a notch to prevent it from rolling back into the mouth of the bottle when poured. Different variations on this theme were tinkered with, but all retained the marble seal. The marble did create an interesting problem. At the time, it was still common practice to return empty bottles and get them refilled. And many bottles at the time had embossed writing on them, stating that they remained the property of the bottling companies. In other words, you were paying for the contents and just renting the bottles. Children did not care about such things and cod bottles were frequently smashed, once empty, to get the marble out. One nickname for the bottle was Alley Bottles, due to the practice of children playing with marbles in alleys. The flip side of this, of course, is that the children would want the soft drink, not just for the tasty drink and sugar rush, but for the toy encased in the bottle. What I have here is a modern survivor of the cod bottles design, still used by the Japanese soda company Ramun. The only key difference between these and the traditional bottles is that the top of a Ramun bottle is made of plastic instead of glass. Unlike the originals, which relied on the purchaser having a wooden tool, every bottle of Ramun comes with a plastic tool for opening it with. I'll show you the procedure for opening the bottle and you can see what the marble does. You put this over the marble, put your hands over it, and hopefully you can see what happens. As you can see, the marble has been pushed down into the bottle, and this notch here allows it to be poured into a glass. The marble is locked behind that notch, and the liquid is able to be poured out. The cod bottle. In 1879, the Hutchinson bottle was invented. They used a metal wire spring and rubber seal instead of a marble. The bottle was opened by driving the seal down to the bottle, the same way you would with a marble. Uh, it was very popular in the United States, but did not catch on in Britain, where the cod bottle was very much dominant. Also in the 1870s, various types of stick bottle were invented. These wooden plugs with rubber o-rings attached on sat in the neck of the bottle the same way as a marble or Hutchinson stopper would, being driven into the bottle to open it in the same way. They did not gain the popularity of either stopper due to the same problem that caused the invention of the torpedo bottle originally. The wooden and rubber stoppers would eventually dry out, lose their seal, and the drink would go flat. While this was not a concern for small-scale local distribution, issues could arise with travel times inherent to international trade at the time. No discussion of soft drinks would be complete without mentioning the big two. In the 1880s, two soft drink giants emerged in the U.S., Coca-Cola was founded by Colonel John Pemberton in Atlanta, Georgia in 1886 as a coca leaf and cola nut based nerve tonic. It claimed to cure various diseases, including morphine addiction and impotence. Uh, there was never that much cocaine in Coca-Cola uh, due to the degrees of dilution involved, but due to public health concerns in 1929, it became cocaine free. Pepsi emerged shortly afterwards in 1893 
invented by chemist Caleb Bradham as a colonut-based tonic to aid in digestion and boost energy. Even the name Pepsi originates from dyspepsia. These two companies, alongside Sweps, the US arm being the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, have grown to dominate the world's soft drink market today. Returning to bottle technology, internal thread stoppers were first used in 1872, but became popular around 1900, particularly with ginger beers and ciders. This ginger beer here has an internal thread, as hopefully you can see. The swing or lightning stopper was first patented in 1875 by Charles de Quilfelt of New York. Originally using a ceramic plug and rubber washer, it allowed bottles to be opened far easier than any of these previous designs. It would overtake the Hutchinson stopper in popularity in the US, but didn't really challenge the cod bottles dominance in the UK. The stopper that would eventually replace all of these, and is still used heavily in the bottling of beer, is the crown top. I've got two examples here. You may recognise the bottle form of this one. Patented by William Painter in 1892, it simplified the design and manufacture of bottles, providing a reliable seal and provides a handy form of currency in Fallout games. Originally using a cork and paper backing inside the metal top, modern crown caps use plastic seals. Crown tops would cease to be used on soft drinks in many places for two main reasons. The improved screw thread developed for glass bottles in the 20th century, and the replacement of glass bottles with metal cans and plastic bottles in many cases. While glass bottles do survive, the market is dominated by these vessels here. Keeping the bubbles in has always been the technical challenge of bottling soft drinks. From the 18th to the 21st century, different methods have been employed to achieve this, gaining sophistication and refinement as technology has developed. I hope this video has helped to illustrate this change over time and provided insight into the history of your sweet sugary drinks. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!